All right. Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to see you all here. It's warm in here, so I might—I don't want to make you guys jump up and exercise. So no closed eyelids, okay? So um, I uh, am a small animal practitioner, and I've been a small animal practitioner for just over 13 years now. So um, I feel like a like an old parent when I stand up here and say I move so quickly, but it really does. It honestly seems like yesterday that I was in your shoes, that I went through veterinary school, and then all of a sudden I look back in 13 years, 14 years to pass. So um, believe your parents when they say that, because it truly is real. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my timeline of, um, that I was what I guess I would call a late bloomer. I had no idea when I was in your shoes that I was going to be a veterinarian. And I always was envious of those students because I had other colleagues in veterinary school that they were like, oh yeah, from the time I could walk, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I, I wish that that was me, but I had no idea. And honestly, I didn't even know until the last probably uh, half semester of my fourth year of undergrad. So I was a very much late bloomer. But um, I also was able to go on to professional school without much of a delay um, because I forethought a little bit about those different kinds of prerequisites. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about is sort of sitting in your shoes. This might be something you know what you want to do, and you might not, and that's okay um, because it's sort of how you set yourself up. You can do a lot of different things to be setting yourself up even right now. So um, for me, uh, I now where I never thought I would be, and I'm a clinical assistant professor at Kansas State. I teach fourth year students primary care medicine. So all of the fourth year students come through um, my corridor, which is primary care. So we see pet pets that are brought in for care um, from clients that are around Manhattan. We have clients that travel actually from a few hours away even because they like our service. And so we give our students an enormous responsibility to take care of those clients and those pets. Um, they have things much like what we're doing today is we actually videotape the student encounters with the client and they have to go and um, meet with the counselor to kind of interact with them to see how they did in that communication with their client. And then they meet with the clinician, which is myself or Dr. Nelson. Some of you may have seen Dr. Nelson speak a few months ago about parasites. Um, and so we then uh, work with the students to help them to understand how to be a good primary care practitioner. And a number of the fourth year students go on to do that for the rest of their career. So some choose small animal primary care, some choose large animal, and some go on to specialize. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. All right, so how do I get there? So these are some of the interests, I guess, that I had and that a lot of people that go into veterinary careers, of course they like animals, that's a given. And I was always told when you go to interview for veterinary school, you don't say, I love animals, because that's a given. And you obviously love animals or you wouldn't have dedicated your life to doing that. So you need a better answer than that one. So yes, we love animals, but we also have to like people. And sometimes we joke that if a dog or cat could just come with their little debit card attached to them, it would make it so much easier because a large part of our day is spent educating the client. And that's, that's funny, but it's not really funny because a large amount of our time is spent engaging with the family. And that's actually a really fun part about being a veterinarian is you become a member in some of those households of that family because you're a trusted um, member of that family to help them make decisions for their pet. And that's a huge responsibility, but it's a lot of fun to you to be able to spend time with them. Science, Again, that's a given. You're going to have to love those kinds of things to be able to endure what it takes to become a veterinarian. It is a service industry, so you also have to have those skills uh, with working with people, um, understanding human behavior, and uh, of course you have to be quite compassionate in business. That's, I think, an important one, but a little less important than these days because there are, and we'll talk a little bit about different careers of working in practices that are not necessarily small animal owned by one owner, but there's also corporate practices that are owned by large companies where the veterinarians choose to practice there because they don't have to enjoy business to do that. So we'll talk a bit about that as well. So for me, my background, I was a farm girl. So I grew up on a 400 head of cattle. We had pigs, we had horses. Um, I had dogs, farm dogs, but the dogs were more outdoor animals and they weren't really in our home. So it's kind of interesting that I went on to become a small animal practitioner. So my background was um, cows, horses, like I said, some farm dogs, puppy dogs, 
So high school was that time when, uh, obviously it's a really fun, but yet a very stressful part of our lives too, is that there's so many things that happen in this time, as you guys know. Um, things that I did that I think set me up to go on to veterinary school, first off, I did a lot of sports. So I was a small town um, girl. I lived 20 miles from the nearest community, and my big town had 600 and I think five people in it, and I had 20 kids in my graduating class. So um, very small, and so when you're in a community that small, some of you may be, I don't know, um, you almost have to do every sport and activity, otherwise they wouldn't have a sports team, right? So I played volleyball and I did basketball and I ran track. Um, I also did a lot of drama and speech, and that's actually what I really enjoyed about high school was being in drama and speech. It's what allows me to be able to stand up here and speak to you guys today. I think those skills came all the way back from high school. Um, you know, maintaining eye contact, having, engaging an audience. Those are things that you learn now, and they're things that are going to be critically important if you go on to a service industry, a career as a professional. Um, those are really, really important things to be partaking in um, in high school. Um, I was also, I think it was called FHA when I was a, a high schooler. Now I think it's FCCLA, which is an organization of kind of community support um, and leadership. And then class officer. Even something like class officer, these are all responsibilities. These are wonderful resume building things for yourself so that when you go on to write those applications for undergrad or even professional school, having all of those experiences makes you a very well-rounded individual and are very important for your future. Volunteer, if you can do that. So I live 20 miles out of town, and so my time volunteering was working for my dad. But if you live in, in an urban area, you might be able to do some of those things. So we had, um, throughout my career in veterinary medicine, I've seen high school students come in and volunteer um, at the hospital on the weekends. And it might not be glamorous things. You might start cleaning kennels and doing some of those kinds of things. But the cool thing is you're going to get to see the way things work. And if you see the way things work, then you may be able to know if that's something that you would want to go on and do it the rest of your life. This is important because I do have veterinary students that come into veterinary school and they almost never stepped foot into a veterinary practice. And that's sad. I think every one of them should have had those kinds of opportunities to know if that's something that they want to do with the rest of their life. Employment, certainly having a job in addition is great if you can manage that. If you can't, that's okay. You know, being able to even have those volunteer types of opportunities are really important. Working hard, subject material, things that I would recommend, foreign language, science, physics, chemistry, and math. I do not enjoy physics, chemistry, or math, you guys. I absolutely <laughs> detested those subjects, but I love science. I love that enough that it pushed me to go on. So you don't have to like all of them, but you do have to do them. So, or you can love them. Maybe you're different than I am. So take risks, lead by example, set goals. And you're going to see that is in K-State Purple for a reason in several of my slides. I'm a big believer in setting goals for yourself. So setting goals means not just writing them down and throwing them inside of a binder, inside of something else that you never look at until maybe two years, and then you find them and you go, what's this? I remember attending a lecture where the speaker talked about you set goals, meaning you might write something down that you want to accomplish in a week or a month or a year or five years or 16 years from now, but you put those up where you can see them, where you get ready in the morning. You put them on a piece of paper and you slap them on your mirror, and so every day you look at those goals. And I do believe that you will somehow find a pathway to those goals if they are in front of your face at all times and not tucked in a binder somewhere. So that is. I think if you remember one thing from the lecture, it's to think about setting goals for yourself of what you want in life. Uh, and those are going to modify, no doubt about it, but it's pretty exciting to be able to reach those goals and know that you've done that for yourself. Inspiring others. Be the type of person, you know, enrich others' lives in addition to your own. So be a good person and work on your communication skills. Undergraduate education, this is also a time where if you can have even a part-time employment, these are going to be opportunities for you to build letters of recommendation and reference and to also get an understanding. When I was an undergrad, um, I did a lot of different things. I was, a, I was a, a mentor for middle and high school students. I used to go into the schools for their after-school program and help them with their, um, their, uh, their education. Basically, I did homework with math and English and social studies and things like that. And that got me an opportunity to sort of get an interest in teaching um, and helping others. 
uh, travel. If you can, it, it, this is a wonderful time, whether it's high school or undergrad, for you to learn a little bit about the world if you don't know much about you know, where you are right now. Branch yourself out, be brave, travel. This is a perfect time to do that before you have all those life's commitments strapped down on top of you. Work hard, learn to relax when you can. I think that's a good message for when you do go to college because um, this is the first time for a lot of people that you may be leaving home, being responsible for taking care of your laundry, not having the sink overflowing with dishes, emptying the dishwasher every once in a while, vacuuming the floor every once in a while when somebody's not doing it for you. And there's a lot of stresses that come at that point in life. You may be now responsible for paying for some of your own bills. So it's really going to be important for you to learn to begin to relax. And I cannot emphasize that enough. In veterinary medicine, if you go on into that career, it can be very stressful. And so you have to find time to help yourself to relax. Diverse coursework, I highlighted those really those same types of classes that I think are very important in undergrad. But for me, I didn't know that I wanted to be a veterinarian, as I said, until very late in my undergraduate curriculum. I was a biology major, but not until very late. I actually was a physics major for a little while. I don't know why. I don't even like physics. Um, I had an undecided major. I was a dance and theater major for a little while in undergrad. I had no idea what I wanted to do, and that's okay. This is the part in life where you're finding out who you are. And so basically trying to take the type of coursework that's going to set you up for a career in medicine, um, those are the kinds of classes. Again, my same things, and again, my K-State purple set goals. So that appears in my undergrad slides as well. Um, it's kind of a weird slide to have on there. So what is that? Yeah, I think those are really cool. And I don't know a ton about them, but I do think they're pretty cool. So what I wanted to focus on this slide, this picture was taken by my eight-year-old. So we were on our way to a volleyball game, and he was uh, going back and, and said, I didn't know what he was doing. So he's taking a picture. But the point of this slide is we all see a praying mantis. But a scientist sees not just the praying mantis, but they're both, I mean, are these even from this planet? I mean, these are like alien beings. Look at those heads and eyes. I mean, they're amazing creatures um, if you're ever going to watch one. Um, but the point of it is that a scientist looks not just at the entire creature, but then they spend time looking at the details of that animal as well. So once you've passed all those hurdles and you've gotten on into veterinary school, work hard, obviously you're going to realize that that's going to be important. I remember though sitting in the auditorium the first day that we had orientation and so um, I had a small, I went to the University of Missouri um, for my veterinary school and we had at that time it was a class size of about 65, now it's probably 120. The point of that is that I remember them taking all 65 of us, putting us into the auditorium and telling us day one that we realize that every one of you have fought and clawed to get to this point in your careers, right? Because you're competitive, you worked hard, you tried to excel. A lot of us are very type A, very driven personalities. But now, that's it, is what they said, that, that ends. Now we're going to work hard together because it's going to take teamwork for you guys to rise up and to be able to get through all of this together. And that is really important is to find those peers and those colleagues um, that social group, because that's going to become very important to get through medical school. It's a, it's a difficult time, and so you want to have other people that can do that with you and not try to take it on all by yourself. Um, re realize at this stage in your career that it becomes very focused. I mean, I remember sitting in undergraduate classes that I wasn't really all that interested in and kind of dozing off, and maybe I didn't come one day. You know, I get it. We all have done that sort of thing um, in undergrad. But then when you get to medical school and you get to a veterinary career, these are critically important things. Every single class you want to be focusing because this is important. It's about not just the pets, but the people in the community that you want to now serve. You want to make those connections, understand the value of teamwork, and then there's that goal setting again. Even every stage in life, I encourage you to set those goals. So whatever you want to accomplish, be re remembering to do that. So what are the qualities that I think a great veterinarian has? Compassion, that's huge. Um, I have learned over the years that you can be an A-plus student and you can understand the pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus, but if you can't convey that to your client and their cat and how for her to take care or him to take care and what it's going to mean to give insulin injections and why they need to switch to a different food, if you can't have compassion for that person and be able to describe the steps to them, you may not ever see them again. They will probably go to somebody else that was able to explain it. It might have been a C student. 
but they could understand and they showed empathy for that client and what they were going through. Compassion is a very, very important quality of a veterinarian. Decision-making skills are also important. One of the things that I most enjoy, and I'll talk a bit about, is emergency medicine. I really enjoy, and I did not used to when I first started practicing. I hate it. I used to try to hide when there was an emergency. I'd go be somewhere else, anywhere else, so I didn't have to deal with that immediate decision-making process. But instead of hiding forever, I forced myself to start going to continuing education so that I would become more comfortable with what to do in those emergency situations, and now I love them. So those are things that are really important as a veterinarian is you have to be able to make a decision because everyone looks for you, to you to make that decision and some people crumble into that pressure and it's very stressful and others rise to the occasion and they're a leader and that is important. Manager, again, there's a question mark there because you don't have to love the business sense to still be a veterinarian in primary care. You might and you might find a great niche for you in a private practice. If you don't, that's okay because we have people that we also hire to do those things when you don't want to. Team player as appropriate, being a leader, again, being an excellent communicator, and being able to problem solve. There are a lot of things that I see daily, weekly, monthly, that I don't know the right answer of how to take care of that situation or how to take care of that animal. I don't know what's wrong with it and maybe the client can't afford or chooses not to do more tests. So I'm going to have to make an educated decision on how to care for that animal, even if the client can't do everything I want them to. And that can be also frustrating for some people, and other people em embrace that because it's an opportunity that for them to use their critical thinking skills to make a decision for that pet. So travel. Um, one of the things that I really um, enjoyed about veterinary school was I did have some opportunities to travel. So. Um, the first one that I was going to show you is, that this is where I got to stay. So this was um, pretty cool. So it's a, actually a manor. I called it a castle when I first arrived. So I got to go to London, um, and just north of London, I got to see Stratford-upon-Avon, where William Shakespeare was born, and tour some of those areas. So I was a, a nutritional representative for Waltham Pet Food Company, which is now um, kind of under the Royal Canaan um, Company, but I was able to go as every uh, veterinary school had one representative. And so uh, right now at Kansas State, we have a representative for Purina and Hills. So each of those students is able to learn more about those diets. So I have had an understanding and appreciation for nutrition and the importance of good quality nutrition for pet care. Um, so as a senior student, I worked for Waltham as a student rep, and they sent me there where they did their clinical trials for their different prescription diets, and I got to see where the pets were cared for. Um, and then I got to do a little touring, too, which is super cool. So anybody know where that is? Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, yeah. So they didn't let me in, but I did go see it. And that was another castle that we toured as the group of students. Um, everybody recognizes that one, right? Big Ben, yeah, Parliament. So um, London is a beautiful, fantastic place, and it's, I have traveled overseas a few times, but if you ever get to go to London, it's a beautiful place um, because everything's so old compared to in the United States. So that was a pretty cool thing. I mean, it was all expense paid um, to get to do that, and that's something that, gosh, I would have never gotten to do later on in life. So before I got strapped down with all the student loan payments and everything else, take these opportunities to travel. Um, I also worked uh, as did an externship for the Food Safety Inspection Service, which takes care of our food supply as a student. Again, trying to understand what do I want to do with my life while I was in veterinary school, and I got to go to Washington, D.C. and see a little bit about how policy is made. Again, great opportunities um, in school. So how do you get to that, you know, that stage? So these were some of my graduating classmates. So. Um, this is a little slide, it's got a lot of words on it, so I apologize for that, but this talks a little bit about the differences. As a primary care practitioner, we are a family doctor for pets, so we are the people that you would take your animal to if it's sick, um, if it needs wellness care, and we'll talk about a few of those things, but this is a bit about what the different types of primary care. So back in the old days, we used to all just go and we would work, work at a small practice, maybe with a single or a few owners. Um, you would probably have a big part of the management of the practice. Um, some of those veterinarians, though, end up doing a lot of business management and a lot less veterinary medicine, so that there's been a push for a lot, uh, a lot of people to go to corporate practice 
they both have their pros and cons. So corporate practices might have larger buying power. Um, sometimes in those larger um, companies, the veterinarians are able to take a position in another city if their spouse needs to move, for example. So there's definite advantages to those practices. Um, if you uh, have a spouse that maybe has to uh, move periodically for their job or needs to be more mobile. Um, Collecting history. So depending on the type of practice that you come to, whether it's a primary care small animal clinic that is a small practice. So for me, um, I practiced in the Omaha area, so just south of Omaha, and I was in a six-doctor practice. Uh, I loved that. I was there for 12 years practicing. And for me, one of the most important parts about being a, a, a really good doctor is the history taking. Um, our patients obviously can't speak, and so there has to be a lot of history collection to understand what's wrong. So oftentimes I think about day one, we're kind of here on this road, and then maybe within the next several minutes, maybe we're way over there, farther along down the road, trying to understand what's going on with that animal. And that takes a lot of critical history taking. So that's an excellent skill that we try to teach our students as they're going through veterinary school is how to collect a useful history from the family that brings that pet in. The physical exam, so um, this is not just rolling the dice or shaking a little ball and, and asking it what you're supposed to do next. So I also emphasize to our fourth year students how important it is to collect a really good physical exam. So a physical exam will help us to understand possibly what's wrong with the animal based on its presenting symptoms or condition, but also to find a lot of problems that you are going to miss if you don't do a really comprehensive, excellent physical exam. So these are different body systems. One that you might not be familiar with is body condition score. We also assess the uh, condition of that animal. Is their weight appropriate for their frame size? We spend a lot of time doing nutritional consultation for our clients to make sure. Um, the statistics are, what, 60 to 70 percent of our pets are probably overweight. Some of them are obese. So that's unfortunately a real problem in, in veterinary medicine as well as we see a lot of overweight dogs and cats and trying to get them into a good body condition. So um, I, I think this saying is funny because I remember people always saying, oh, you can't even see the forest, you can only see the trees or vice versa. But I think it's important to be an excellent doctor to see both the trees and the horse. So just like that picture of the praying mantis, you have to look at the praying mantis, but now we have to focus on each of those individual pieces to really understand what's going on with that animal. So neonatal care. So I'll start out with kind of some of the, the cool things. I get to see a lot of puppies and kitties at Kansas State. I love that because we have a lot of undergraduate and veterinary students that are getting their first pet, and that's super cool to be able to help them with that. A lot of them have never had a pet before, and so they're caring for their first animal. Um, so it's very fun to get to see the fourth-year students sort of take that process and help a family when they first adopt that new animal and what's involved with that. That is probably the cutest Boston Terrier I've ever seen. That's a super cute dog in my hands there. So neonatal care vaccines. So we all know that those are important, and though they start out in those neonatal, very young puppies and kitties that we're vaccinating them. So that's one of the things that we would do in primary care. Heartworm prevention, flea and tick deworming products, um, weight management. I mentioned that a couple times. Nutritional consultation. How do we feed and care for a puppy or kitty as opposed to an adult or a senior or geriatric animal or one that has special medical needs? Spaying and neutering, I'll go into that in a bit of detail a little bit later. Disorders of bones or growth, some of those are things that we can do on our own in primary care practice. Others are going to need to be referred to a specialist in orthopedic surgery. So um, those are always things that we are looking for and for growth disorders in youngsters. Virus testing in cats, things like feline leukemia and FIV, which are viral infections that cats can get and can be very devastating for their families when they have that. And so those are things that we look for in young uh, kittens, and then behavior guidance. So that's kind of starting out with the neonatal care. Wellness, I've listed a few of the vaccines, some of these you might be familiar with, distemper, parvo, and rabies, and then those non-core ones. So a core vaccine is a vaccine that we give to all dogs. So regardless of their living situation, these are diseases that either have a high morbidity, meaning a lot of animals if exposed would get that disease, or they have a high mortality, meaning that most animals that get that disease would die as a result. The non-core vaccines are diseases that we think about based on the individual animal. Do they go to a boarding facility? Are they the little white fluffy dog that never leaves the pet parent's arms? Do they never even touch the ground outside? 
or do they spend a lot of time at lakes and streams and hunting and, and going camping with their families? Um, Lyme disease, we don't see a ton of this in Kansas. This is definitely if you have any friends or family that live on the East Coast or Upper Great Lakes, this is a tick-borne illness that we also can vaccinate for. The importance in, in those care, I mentioned flea and tick products. We have a lot of tick-borne illness here in Kansas and Missouri, and so those are diseases that can affect the, vet, the family as well as the dogs and sometimes cats. So it's very important that we're using products to protect them against those illnesses as best as we can. Wellness for cats, um, FBRCP, which is an upper respiratory viruses, and rabies are core vaccines. And then the non-core, feline leukemia, or to tell I rarely give, would be for the kitty cats that go to a lot of boarding facilities, for example. So preventative programs, I've already mentioned fleas and ticks and all those diseases. Intestinal parasites, these can kill young puppies or kitties if we don't deworm them at a very young age. So we like to see our puppies and kitties when they are first adopted. So somewhere usually between six to eight to nine weeks of age, we're seeing them for their first initial wellness checkup, deciding what vaccines they need. There's a whole lot that goes into those first puppy and kitty visits. Heartworm disease prevention in both dogs and cats. So heartworm disease is a mosquito-borne pathogen that affects the heart, and it affects both dogs and cats. In cats, we don't have a treatment for them if they get this disease, so instead we try to prevent the disease through these different products that we apply to keep um, keep the mosquitoes away or to um, give the cat a product in the event that they do get exposed that they don't get infected. Anesthesia um, is one of the things that I think, um, before I went to uh, third and fourth year in my curriculum, we went into clinical rotations where they teach you about these different subject materials. Anesthesia was a really scary topic for me, and even as a new veterinarian, I think anesthesia is one of those things that I remember being told as a new veterinarian, if you're not a little bit scared every time that you have an anesthetic um, that you're giving, you probably should hang it up right now because you should always have a, a respect for that ability to be able to make that animal unconscious and then to bring them back out of that unconscious state. That This is where a lot of continuing education and time is spent in veterinary medicine making sure that the veterinarian is competent and comfortable with this so that we can then be able to provide those things. So we use anesthesia to treat pain, suffering, disease, prevention of disease, but also for the safety of our staff and the safety of the patients. There are some of these guys that come in that have absolutely no interest in being taken care of in the veterinary hospital. They're terrified, they're fearful, and for their safety and ours, we may need to give them sedation. So those are things that we spend a lot of time training and getting comfortable with administering anesthesia. We, of course, have specialists that only do anesthesia in our specialty and referral hospitals, but those are for cases that require advanced care, whereas in a primary care practice, you would be doing anesthesia on an everyday basis several times a day. So you do tend to get a lot more comfortable as a result. To breed or not to breed. So castration, neuter, ovariohysterectomy, ovariectomy. So in Europe, for many, many years, they've been doing ovariectomy, which is removing the ovaries and leaving the uterus. And so that is starting to become more common in the United States as well. So these are surgeries that would be very common to perform in primary care practice. So most clients would not go to a referral institution to have these types of surgeries performed. They are very important surgeries for most of our pets for the obvious reason of pet overpopulation, but also disease. So intact females are at risk of breast cancer, as well as what we call pyometra, which is an infection in the uterus that can develop if they are not spayed. Um, in the male dogs, they can get testicular cancer, very anal tumors, and prostate infections. So in addition to straying and getting hit by cars and roaming and breeding, there's also health concerns that we are trying to prevent by spaying and neutering. So these are different anesthetic procedures that would be commonplace in a primary care practice. So anything, I mentioned the span neuter fracture repair. So the six doctor practice that I was at in Omaha, we had one of our veterinarians that if he could just do orthopedic surgeries all day, he was thrilled. So he loved that part of it. I did not, but that was his thing. So that's the cool thing also about being a primary care doctor is that each of us has our special interests. So if you don't enjoy that part of it, Sometimes you don't have to do it. You might have another colleague who's interested in that part of it. The nucleation is removal of the eye, so a condition that might require that if the animal had an untreatable condition. Spleen removal oftentimes would be for a, a, a tumor of the spleen. Uh, enterotomy versus resection. So enterotomy is making an incision into the intestine to remove a foreign object, whereas an intestinal resection anastomosis is actually taking a piece of the intestine out 
and oftentimes it is for a tumor removal or, or an object removal and then closing those pieces back together. Ligament injuries, tumor removals, whether they be on the skin or inside the body, um, cesarean section to remove puppies that aren't able to be delivered or kittens, bladder stone removal, which is one of my favorite surgeries. So bladder stones are actually fairly common in dogs and cats, so surgeries to remove them, collecting biopsies from multiple organs, placing feeding tubes. This is only a small list, but you get the picture that primary care veterinarians do an awful lot of a diverse amount of things. So it definitely is one of those careers that gives you lots of stuff. Nutritional guidance. This was my first cat, and it really he's pretty overweight. So I always joke with my clients, I might know how to help you to get weight off of your patient, but some of us don't lead by example very well. So nutritional guidance is actually quite a bit of what I spend time with at Kansas State is teaching the students how to establish a good body condition for a dog or cat and then trying to help to give the client the right guidance on providing enough calories and nutrition to either put weight on an animal or to take weight off of them. Diagnostic testing, one of my favorite parts about being a veterinarian is being able to have lots of ability to test various organ systems. So blood and urine testing, stool testing. Um, in primary care practice, there are a lot of uh, primary care practices that have even advanced imaging. CT, MRI are actually even present in some of the primary care practices, believe it or not, not just always referral institutions. Diagnostic equipment, just a couple pictures, CBC and a chemistry profile analyzer. A lot of practices are going to have these on tabletop in their practice. Some of them won't, and they'll need to send those out to a company that's able to run and have a good turnaround time. I had a larger practice that I operated in Omaha, so in that practice, we did have a lot of standalone equipment so that we could get an instant turnaround for a patient that needed critical care. Just the next, right? So this one. Um, Kind of, this is an animal laying like this. So the tummy is up there and it's got a lot of black in there. So on x-ray, um, the black, which this is the outside of the film, but of the body of the animal, air is black and bones are very white. So you can see the pelvis and the backbone and the stomach is pretty descended on this, on this dog that eaten something and was throwing up. Um, sorry, it's kind of a gross picture. <laughs> Good thing we're not right after lunch. But cancer care and treatment, um, this was a cat that I cared for in the primary care practice in Omaha that was given a very poor prognosis for a tumor around the, the rear end of this animal and was in a lot of pain. And at that time, it had already had a surgery to remove the tumor and it had regrown. And that cat was not given a very good prognosis. I worked with the oncologists at Kansas State who were wonderful to work with. And in the practice I was in, we did quite a bit of oncology and a lot of chemotherapy. So this cat was given um, six months, and it's been two, almost three years now. Cat still alive. So it had had chemotherapy so many times that they ended up bringing the cat down to Kansas State to have um, an infilling catheter placed to give um, to give chemo because all the veins had pretty much were shot at this point because it had so many catheters for IVs for chemotherapy. So this can also be. Um, something that you can offer to clients in primary care that perhaps can't travel to a university, they don't have the means to do that, and you're able to offer some of those things in primary care practice, which can be very gratifying. Some of our cancer patients will go on to have a cure from their cancer. Others are going to be palliated, meaning that we reduce their pain and suffering, and we're able to give that family the time that they desire with that animal, which can be extremely rewarding as a primary care practitioner. Oral care, um, we do also spend a lot of time counseling clients on how to care for the teeth um, and how to also take care of that, them in the clinic. So this would be a common reason for anesthesia in a general practice would be doing a what we call subgingival cleaning, so up above the gum line and also taking x-rays of the teeth and caring for the mouth. It is a very important part of owning an animal is to take care of that mouth because it can harbor a lot of disease, infection, and pain. I always tell clients that, you know, we hate to have to put them under anesthesia, but it's really the only way to do a good job to do that, that cleaning the teeth. And if we ignore them, that patient is probably going to come in and they're going to need a lot of dental care and a lot of teeth to be pulled, a lot of expense, and a lot more time under anesthesia if we don't care for them in the time. Respiratory illness, kind of a blurry picture, but this is a dog with a very snotty nose. So respiratory illness would be another common thing that we would see, whether it be upper respiratory disease, what's commonly called kennel cough, or also pneumonia and lower airway disease would also be commonly managed in a primary care practice. Heart disease, one of my favorites to treat in primary care. Now I actually am really kind of 
I have a cardiologist like two doors down from where I practice now at Kansas State, which is pretty cool, so I can go pick his brain when I need it. But in primary care, I didn't have a cardiologist. The closest cardiologist was three hours away. So there were a number of my clients that just simply couldn't travel to, to a university to see a cardiologist. And so as a primary care practitioner, I would have to do the best job that I could. And so things like congenital heart disease, conditions that the dogs or cats are born with, ECG analysis is something that would be commonplace for a veterinary and primary care practice to be able to understand those little blips and bumps for the electrical activity of the heart. Interpreting x-rays, some of them, we had a doctor in our practice that did cardiac ultrasound as well. So with special training, um, that's one of the really neat things about being a private practice veterinarian is that you also can achieve special training to, a lot of, to do a lot of things and to offer your clients things. Uh, in the in the case, it's definitely no substitute for them to refer to a specialist, but for those clients that can or choose not to, um, to be able to offer that is pretty cool. Emergency medicine, I said I like emergency medicine, so I was thinking of a few of the common emergencies that I've seen over the years. And so um, toxins, so some of you may or may not know raisins and grapes can be very poisonous to, to dogs. Um, chocolate, most people know about rat poison, xylitol. Let me know what xylitol is. It's, well, it's a, it's a, um, it's in a lot of our sugarless gum. So in people that have sugar restrictions, like diabetes, where they can't take sugar products, these are sugar substitute. Um, and this is a very toxic product to a dog. So if you are chewing your sugarless gum, don't be spitting it on the ground so your dog can get it. Um, I've had dogs get in shopping bags and eat a, a package of sugarless gum and come in with xylitol toxicity. So make sure if you're buying that sugarless gum, you are not letting it be around your dog. Antifreeze is another one that we would deal with. Heat stroke is one of my favorite emergencies. It's, this is a devastating thing when it happens because we see it in these you know, happy labs that go out and they are more than willing to fetch and chase the ball for hours on end and then they come in with temperatures of 111 degrees and they are in multiple organ failure and to be able to take those animals from the brink of death and save their life can be pretty cool. But it is also one of the hardest ones because a lot of times I've had families brawling out in the waiting room because somebody let a dog stay outside in the heat and the other found out about it and they brought it in. So this can be a devastating one for a family. Um, things like we see uh, dogs that are back dogs, a lot of our dachshunds and miniature dachshunds come in with back problems, inability to walk. Bee stings, um, bleeding uncontrollably, heart failure, reproductive emergency of an animal that couldn't deliver those puppies or kitties on their own. Urethral obstruction would be the, the male cats that obstruct from urethral grit or stony material that can build in their, in their uh, penile urethra and they can't go to the bathroom and that's a medical emergency. Um, gastric dilatation volvulus is where the stomach bloats and turns on itself. That's also a medical emergency um, that could be treated in primary care practice. Vehicular injuries, seizures, um, also one of my favorites to treat is an animal that is in what we call status epilepticus, where they're continually seizuring. Um, those can be a very big medical challenge to work on those patients. Troubles breathing, two of the worst ones I can think of, I had two dogs that presented um, dead on arrival because they had balled up a piece of rawhide and got it stuck in the back of their throat. They couldn't breathe. One of them was a little puppy and they had let him chew on a rawhide that probably wasn't appropriate for him. Eye problems, ulcer, and then proptosis is some of these little flat-faced dogs like pugs, they can get hit or squished and their eyeball will pop out. Um, and sometimes we can put that back in and restore vision, sometimes we can't. Hence the reason for an nucleation or an eye removal in some of them if the problem is too bad. Behavior consultation, that's um, uh, quite a bit also of what I do at Kansas State is that we don't have a behavior specialist at Kansas State. There is one in the St. Louis area, but a lot of folks can't, uh, can't travel that far. And so we do see quite a few behavior consultations. These will be common problems that we might see, anything from problems with jumping, training, quiet, or barking, cats with inappropriate litter box use. Oh, those can be so frustrating for their families and really strain that human-animal bond when that cat stops using that litter box and starts using somebody's bed or uh, something else. Anxiety in dogs, especially separation anxiety storms. We get a lot of, Fort Riley does a lot of artillery shelling and it's like rattle your house like 30 miles away kind of sounds. And a lot of those dogs, they feel so bad for them because they don't understand what's going on and they might be shelling at any point in a 24-hour period for a week on end. So for some of these animals, it can create a lot of stress. 
fireworks, oh my gosh, it's so much fun for some of us and so awful for some of our dogs. They absolutely hate this time of the year. The storms that we have rolling through Kansas can be super stressful. Sometimes it's the, the lightning, other times it's the thunder. For some animals, it's even just those pressure changes and the static discharges in the air that maybe we don't even know that are there, but where a lot of our dogs do. And sometimes even just fear of other pets, other dogs and cats, especially if they've never been properly socialized as a puppy, that they are not comfortable being around other dogs. Endocrine diseases are diseases of hormones, um, so things like diabetes, thyroid conditions. Um, so these are also conditions that can be procedures where sometimes we will send them to an internal medicine specialist, like the ones at Kansas State. Other times they may be things that are very capable of a primary, primary care practitioner to deal with as well. Skin evaluations, um, so things like skin infections, tumors and masses and ear infections. Ear infections are a really common thing in Kansas. So I like practicing in Kansas because we have a lot of allergies here, which actually, if you like skin problems, it's, it's a fun state to practice in. So um, because of that, if you're a dog with allergies or a person with allergies, probably not quite so enjoyable. Different things that, especially we see in dogs, flea allergies, food, and environmental allergies, things to the pollens and things around us that they can really react to. Um, these are a couple of mice that I thought were kind of fun. So they're almost like little wormy creatures, and this is called Demodex. And Demodex is a parasite that can live on the dog's skin, and it lives way down in the hair follicles, and it makes the hair fall out. And most of these pets don't come in itchy, but some of them do because they'll get a bacterial infection down in the hair follicle. Um, so this can be a really cool uh, way to use your microscope in the practice is to diagnose that. It's pretty simple to diagnose. And this is a short body Demodex. This is his little body up here and then his little tail down there. And he's a, a small or short body. We don't see them very often, so that was a lucky find. Um, this is a patient that presented with years of scratching. And this was the culprit. And I, practicing for 13 years, this was the first time I've ever been able to find this mite. It is incredibly hard to find on a skin scrape. So this is a sarcoptics or scabies mite um, that also can live on. This is, a, this is a one that's unique to dogs, so it doesn't cause disease in humans. They can get on people and make us itchy. But boy, do they wreak havoc for dogs when they get on them. I have a technician that's a little strange. I think sometimes she likes to take scotch tape when she finds fleas on a pet and she'll collect the flea eggs from their coat and then she puts them on a microscope slide and then she watches them every day until the egg hatches out the little baby flea. So um, that's a little tiny baby flea under the microscope. So he's very little. So that's a little how big he is on the scale. GI distress, had to write it in green because it can be so upsetting. So these tummy problems, um, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, constipation, difficulty eating, these are common things that a private practice veterinarian would see. Um, I wrote, I put the pictures of the hot dog and the hamburger because that is honestly a common thing that we see, especially after Thanksgiving. Um, I think, you know, we see a lot of people that eat the pet under the table. I get it. We all sort of like to do that. But when your other 30 house guests are doing the same thing, then we oftentimes see GI distress. And hopefully that's all it is. Some of them go on to get what we call pancreatitis, which can be a life-threatening problem associated with eating, especially fatty foods or foods the dog's not used to. So um, these would be things that can be challenging for the family. These are clients that come in and they want it fixed like yesterday because the dog's having diarrhea all over things or vomiting everywhere. They're going out of town. We need to get it fixed, et cetera. Geriatric medicine, so kind of taking them from the babies to the old guys. And again, that's one of my favorite things about being able to do this is to be able to see those pets through all the stages of life. Um, to be able to help that family to now care for those older guys, to help them keep weight on. Pain management is a huge component of veterinary medicine, is to be able to give those pets good quality of life in their senior years. And if they spend all those years being overweight or obese, a lot of them are going to develop some pretty significant pain and osteoarthritis that are going to need our help. Um, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, our pets experience changes with aging much like people do. So whereas in human medicine, we might ship our parents or grandparents off and have an MRI and an evaluation with a neurologist, not every client can do that. And that means that a lot of our problems go under recognized. Those pets that now stand and stare at the wall, go outside and just walk aimlessly in the yard. That's very, very hard for a, a family to see their pet become um, become like that. So those are also problems in kidney disease. This can happen at any age, but oftentimes in our geriatric and senior cats especially as we're trying to give those, uh, those parents guidance on how to take care of their elderly cats. Some of the other
other guys. I couldn't leave that out. So these are only a couple of the other types of critters that we also can see in primary care small animal practice. So a lot of pocket pets. When I was in the Omaha practice, we had two of our veterinarians that, although we all saw dogs and cats, they also saw a lot of the exotics. So they saw birds and reptiles and snakes and hamsters and guinea pigs and ferrets. Um, we had an exotics client that we had a black bear come in one day. We had tiger cubs that came in. So you can also really branch out. So a lot of veterinarians go on. So one of the things that I'm working on right now is becoming a specialist in primary care medicine. So um, in veterinary medicine, once you practice for five years, you're then able to be able to do an independent residency. So you write case reports, you take an examination, and you can become a specialist in private practice medicine. So um, these are all things that are opportunities for you even once you finish. Volunteer, I couldn't leave that out. So one of the great things about being a veterinary professional is that you can get to do all these cool things. So this was um, a training exercise that we had in Salina a couple of months ago that was called CARE, which is a Kansas animal response exercise. So we went to Crisis City. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that, but it's a training facility that the military will use for training operations, and they have a rubble pile. And we had search and rescue dogs that were out there. We basically did a mock drill like a tornado had hit, and we were on site now, and we were having to then deal with casualties as well as animals that were displaced in a rescue situation. We had horses on site, so oops. We had horses on site, we had large animal veterinarians kind of reminding some of us small animal people about how to care for these kind of animals because people that do these types of volunteer activities, even though they might be small animal practitioners, they may be called upon to help with a bull or a cow or a horse that might be tangled in barbed wire and cut up after a tornado, for example. So um, these are all opportunities that I would encourage you if you take on a medical career that you then, once you get settled in your career, take an opportunity to give back, um, give back through volunteering. <clears throat> Um, those are some of the people that attended, so Crisis City. Um, these are some of the things that I guess I've enjoyed um, in, in Omaha as well as now at Kansas State. I perform uh, part of the Boy Scout Explorers Program, um, which is an opportunity for high school and middle school students to come to see what it's like to have a veterinary career. Um, I mentioned the Kansas Animal Response Exercise. I'm also on the Kansas State Animal Response Board, board which is a team of, of veterinarians as well as non-veterinarians who donate their time in a, in a time of crisis. So we had people from the group that went to um, Hurricane Katrina, um, Hurricane Matthew a few months ago. We had people that went out there. Um, also when there are fires, when there are tornadoes, these are the people that would come to try to help your animals in crisis. So um, pretty cool thing. A lot of veterinarians do daycare, school programs, lectures, veterinary high school lectures, radio and media interviews. So a career that can, can be quite, uh, quite enjoyable. When I was preparing the lecture, I also thought about where else have I gone for continuing education. I mentioned the fun part about traveling, but part of being a veterinarian is also committing yourself to learning and growing. And so these are some of the places that I've traveled over the last several years. And I certainly have had other opportunities even out of the country that I could have went to, but these are different opportunities. So that's also pretty, pretty great to be able to get to go to meet other veterinarians and see speakers from all over the world. Finally, end of life. So these are, um, I think what oftentimes troubles people about going into a veterinary career is having to help clients to make that end of life decision. And I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that that's easy because it's not easy, but what makes it easier is knowing that the human animal bond is a very strong part of many of our families' lives and appreciating that and having compassion for those families, helping them to recognize when there is no further things that can be done for that animal or if that animal is on hospice care at home, how do we keep them comfortable? How do we make sure that our family is doing the right thing? Helping them to make decisions, because a lot of people really need help at that part of, of the animal's life to make sure that they're doing the right things. And that really comes down to being a good listener, having those good communication skills, and having compassion, because if you don't have those things, again, probably they're gonna to go to somebody who does rather than you. Um, and this is why we do it. Right? So this is a little boy, this is my son, and, and a dog. So this is why we do it, because of the human-animal bond. That's the emphasis of being a primary care veterinarian is the diversity, the interest, and the really cool thing about being able to give that type of bond to a family and help them through all of that. Have you ever been up to South Dakota, the little burrows that stick their head in your car and want everything you have? Oh, we're super cute. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Do we have any questions? I'm going to check 
and see if yeah. the tools students have any questions. So I didn't really go into in the lecture. I, I kind of, I obviously I'm at Kansas State now. So I was in private practice for 12 years in Omaha, and we used to have senior extra and veterinary students that would come through our practice. And I realized how much I enjoyed teaching um, through those experiences, and I love seeing things through a student's eyes because um, it just it made me invigorated to be a veterinarian again. Um, that interest and sort of the new, you know, the exciting part of what they're, they were going through. And so it brought me to want to teach. So I was lucky enough to get a position at Kansas State where I can do just that. So um, that was my goal. And I really wasn't sure of how I would accomplish that, but I kept that goal in front of me and eventually it, it came to me. So that hence the emphasis on setting goals for yourself. You guys have questions because Ms. Toole says her group does not. Do you have any questions for Dr. Boyd? And I do have my email address on that front slide. If anybody wants it or has questions later, you can always email me. I'm happy to answer those if I can. Okay. 